Hey everyone, Cameron here. Are you enjoying listening to State of Identity each week as much as I enjoy recording it? If so, help us out by taking the 2020 State of Identity listener survey. Just click the link in the show notes below. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you again, and on to the show. Welcome to State of Identity. I'm your host, Cameron D'Ambrosi. Joining me this week is Jessica Patel, Chief Commercial Officer with Airside. Jessica, welcome to State of Identity. Thank you. So you have a quite the fascinating background that kind of touches on a few layers of digital identity before joining Airside. Uh, you know, I always find it instructive for folks to share a little bit of their personal backgrounds and kind of their unique on ramps uh, to getting into the digital identity space. Would love for you to to walk us through what you were up to uh, in your lead up to joining Airside, and then maybe we can dive into what you've built and uh, what the platform does. Sure. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, So before I came to Airside, uh, I was with American Express for a little over 10 years. Um, The most recent years of that time, um, I was the the general manager of the travel payments group. So we were helping travel organizations, um, you know, settle their payments with their with their vendors. Um, And not unlike the digital identity space, um, you know, there was a a real need for to protect them from fraud, to protect them, um, you know, from a detail orientation perspective and things like that. And so um, there was a lot of that, you know, and to make sure that there wasn't, you know, people stealing the cards and reusing and so on. And so the technology there was really a one-to-one basis for transactions. And I think there's a real parallel to digital identity there. Um, you know, as identity, I think is such a core to the payments industry. Um, and then, you know, it's, it was actually one of my clients there um, who had gone to college with our CEO here, um, who introduced us when I was looking to uh, make a change and, and get more into the startup space um, as somebody who, um, you know, having had my travel background and since our earliest digital identity products here are in the service of the travel industry, um, it felt like a good fit for me to make the jump and continue to find um, new ways to support that same client base um, within, you know, with a similar kind of innovative technology. And from a consumer perspective, I think, you know, in, in pivoting to airside, uh, folks are probably most familiar who have traveled at all recently with uh, the mobile passport app that you guys offer. Uh, but obviously, there are some other really exciting things that you're working on that you're uh, here to talk about today. Would you mind giving uh, folks just a quick you know, 10,000 foot overview uh, of what you've built at Airside, and then we can uh, dive a little bit deeper? Yeah, absolutely. So from the earliest days of mobile passport, um, you know, as you said, that's that's the uh, consumer product that most folks uh, know, know us for. Um, you know, we that product's been out for about six years, and in the earliest stages of development there, um, you know, back where it was really the mentality in the industry to collect as much data as possible, um, our founders took a really different approach and thought, you know, that kind of sensitive data really belongs to the user. It should be completely in their hands. They should have control over who can access it and when and under what circumstance. And so um, interestingly, uh, the the earliest architecture of mobile passport was really built in a way in which, um, you know, put the user in control of their own data. Um, and so over time, as we were out there and we developed some of our B2B products, um, which allow for businesses to um, you know, kind of quickly onboard customers by capturing their identity um, information in a secure way and exchanging that information securely. What we found was business customers were coming to us and asking, um, you know, how we were keeping the information safe, what were the core components of our architecture. And as we started to explain it, um, kind of a new category emerged where really, um, instead of just these component pieces of digital identity, are, uh, these businesses were coming to us and saying, you know what, can we actually just leverage your approach to identity management and, and data uh, security to manage our own information? And so over the last couple of years, we've really um, kind of leaned into that and created a suite of products that allow businesses to 
um, you know, access information in a time bound and consent driven way without ever having to store the information in their own systems. And so it allows them to um, stay more compliant um, and, and, and kind of reduce their liability associated with privacy regulations like GDPR or CCPA um, and still maintain the operations that they need. Um, and conversely, you know, as we as we look to grow how we're supporting consumers, um, we've really grown beyond just that customs application that Mobile Passport provides um, into a broader digital identity solution um, in which consumers can manage their access um, manage the access to their sensitive information, you know, whether it's in banking, whether it's in travel, whether it's in insurance, education technology these days, health tech, and so on. Um, it's really, you know, we're seeking to be a ubiquitous form of digital identity that continues to put the control of sensitive information in the consumer's hands. And, you know, from that perspective, obviously, COVID-19 has really you know, blown up uh, the status quo, I guess, for lack of a better word, maybe even blown up is not uh, enough to fully capture the reality of what is going on and how so many different industry verticals are essentially coping with the reality that they're unable to interact face to face with their consumers. Uh, in terms of those verticals that you think are the best fit uh, for these new product offerings, where are you guys really uh, hoping to uh, to capture some market share in terms of applications for this platform? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I, the world has changed so much in these last couple of months, and um, you know, I think that there's some industries in the really short term that have gone fully virtual that people might not have expected, such as um, you know, technology supporting virtual education, the need to. Um, confirm that a student is who they are when they enroll, the need to confirm they are who they are when they um, take an important test and so on. Um, you know, obviously virtual healthcare um, and just the overall um, health tech space has has really evolved and become a bigger need um, in these, you know, more recent weeks as well. And, um, you know, there I think there's a real need to confirm both the physician as well as the patient, um, you know, and things like that. So there's some of these industries that um, were not nearly as virtual as they are today uh, that I think that there's a real need for digital identity to, uh, to play a major role. And then when I think about even just in the next few months, hopefully, um, you know, when we start to come out of this, um, how the recovery is going to look in a lot of critical industries. Um, and what changes we're going to have to make, right? I don't think a lot of industries are going to go back to operating the way they did before, um, you know, before this pandemic. And so, you know, when I think about the changes that all kinds of industries, travel and retail um, and other physical locations will have to make, I think there's going to continue to be some um, moves to, to offer digital options rather than physical. Um, and I think, in, in the physical interactions, you know, whether you're in an airport, whether you're in a retail store and so on, there's going to be a real push to implement more touchless or contactless solutions with fewer shared touch points. And I think that's where, um, you know, leveraging digital ID and leveraging biometric technologies are going to play a huge role in the recovery of a lot of these, um, a lot of these verticals. And so diving into the platform itself, obviously, um, we're at a very unique inflection point where digital identity is um, really taking off, but at the same time, concerns around privacy, around data security remain heightened. Uh, can you talk through, excuse me, how uh, how the platform works and, and how you can have this balancing act of accessibility uh, and transmitting you know, enterprises, the data that they need to feel comfortable that the identity of the the person joining a platform and registering is who they say they are, while at the same time guaranteeing uh, that that person is not sacrificing uh, their personal data to uh, an insecure platform? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, I think privacy and security are at the core of everything that we have built. And there's a few, a few important pieces so from a data privacy perspective, mm -hmm. everything that we do is user controlled and consent driven. Um, and so consumers that are, um, you know, members of ours who are interacting with businesses using their digital ID, 
would be giving a consent that has a few core elements that I think are super important. So they're always informed, number one, which organization or, or company or body is going to access their information. Number two, how long they're going to have access to that information. Um, you know, I think access should always be time bound. It shouldn't be kind of a standing consent, if you will. Um, what purpose they're accessing that information for, right? I think right now there's data that consumers believe they're giving a business for one purpose, such as onboarding themselves, and it really then crosses the transom over to marketing or, or other communications that they didn't necessarily realize they were consenting to. So I think giving that context or purpose um, is super important. And then the last piece is which pieces of information. And so, you know, we're big proponents of sharing the least amount of um, information required operationally. So it's not the case that just because you might have, you know, included your passport or included your driver's license um, in your airside account, that you necessarily want all of that information being transmitted every time. And so it's the case that the business is able to tell us what is the lowest amount of information they need. And that consumer is then informed um, transparently when they give that consent of all four of those critical pieces of information. Um, and then conversely, from the business's perspective, um, they are able to interact using our proprietary Airside X API. Um, and what that API allows them to do is access that information on a limited basis based on those, uh, you know, the parameters of that consent that was given. And I think what's really unique about our technology is where other organizations are enforcing, um, you know, consent components more from a contractual basis. We're um, using what we like to call a cryptographically enforced consent ceremony, which is basically a fancy way of saying that the elements of that consent are actually built into the encryption, are built into the technology itself. And so it's the case that the business couldn't access it if they tried, if they're outside of those consent parameters. And I think that's a really important um, way to keep the data safe. Um, the other core component in terms of the data security is that we use a really decentralized approach. Um, the information is stored on the individual's device at rest, and that creates a lot of decentralization. It's also the case that that consent, um, that consent is really creating a one-to-one -one, uh, connection between the business and the individual. So there is no central database. There is no master key. No one at Airside can ever access the data. And there's no one party that can ever access a, a cache of data. There's no honeypot anywhere. And I think that that's a really important core to our uh, data security approach as well. And from the perspective of, you know, what uh, on-ramps folks have uh, to onboard themselves, obviously the mobile passport app uh, leverages the passport. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, the API-based solution for non-immigration you know, immigration control or, or border uh, applications works and what types of credentials uh, consumers can leverage to onboard themselves using this platform? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the API consumption happens on the business side, of course. And so for them, you know, I mean, it's a pretty flexible solution. Um, it's really designed to be customized to what not just the industry needs, but what that particular um, player within the industry needs. We understand that different companies have different um, different operations and we want to we wanted to design our solution to be super flexible based on how they're existing um, customer journey or customer flow works. Um, in terms of the consumers, um, the individuals, um, we are, um, you know, kind of in the early beta stages of our Airside app. Um, and that's, that's our broader digital identity app. Um, what the individuals can do there once they download is they have the ability to enroll a variety of documents, um, including their passport, including driver's licenses, um, and in certain cases, they're able to include other types of uh, identity documents that are use case specific. So, um, you know, in certain healthcare situations, somebody might have to add a medical license. In um, certain 
uh, you know, let's take pilot training, for example, right? So when a, when a pilot goes to get trained on a new aircraft, they might have to include things like their pilot license or, or other uh, similar documents. And so it can be customized on a use case basis. Um, and where possible, such as driver's license or passports, um, we do our best to um, use our unique connections, um, you know, to source databases to confirm that the information is source verified um, and where possible also authenticate the documents as well. And so, you know, depending on what the use case is, we have different elements to make sure that the business has the peace of mind they need that the information being provided is um, accurate. And from an implementation perspective, what kind of lift is required uh, to get this up and running? You know, uh, obviously, every scenario is uh, is unique. But, uh, you know, if I have a, a startup and I'm looking to, to get the platform integrated, what kind of engineering resources are required to, you know, turn this on and, and start uh, getting folks on board? Yeah. So, um, you know, depending on what components of the API they need and, and you know, how they're existing infrastructure is set up, um, you know, it's pretty easy to get folks even onto a test agreement really early and, and get them a sandbox environment to start, um, to start developing. Um, we do, we do uh, provide technical resources from our side to um, help any business that partners with us on any customization that they need and to help them, um, you know, best understand how to leverage the core components of our API for integration. Um, you know, we, it, we find that it varies across uh, businesses, but we've certainly had businesses that were able to integrate some of our products as, you know, as early as weeks. Um, you know, so it's it's a pretty fast process, um, and you know, we're happy to to partner with any of our with any of our customers in whatever way they need to make sure they, you know, that they're all set for a, a fast integration. And from a cost perspective, again, obviously. Uh, every application is different, uh, but would you be able to share, you know, uh, what the model is? Is it a flat fee? Is it uh, per transaction? Uh, a hybrid model? How do, how does that uh, how does that work? Yeah, sure. So, um, in total, on the business side, we actually have five products. Um, so we have a set of SDKs that customers can use if they want to do the onboarding themselves. Um, there are a set of offline SDKs that can be put directly into the business's app. Um, that's really for them to manage their own data collection, but it is um, secure in that it is offline. So no one at Airside can um, access any of the information. And, um, you know, examples are document scanning, NFC chip reading, um, and biometric quality selfies. Um, and so with SDKs like that, it's a license fee um, that you know, we're relatively flexible. We usually do a monthly license contract, but, you know, we'll work with the customers if they want to change a structure to be quarterly or annual. Um, for our APIs, we have two sets of APIs. Um, one is the verification API. That's the one that customers would leverage if they wanted to do source confirmations of passport information, visa information, driver's licenses, and so on. Um, in that case, it is a per transaction basis. Um, and then the same with the Airside X API, which is the uh, which is the API that we offer that allows for consent based exchange of the information um, in a secure way. Uh, I guess from the inclusion perspective, um, how are you tackling uh, you know folks who maybe don't have access to these documents? Do you have plans in the roadmap to uh, spin up options that don't rely on uh, document based verification? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we certainly, um, you know, today the AirSight solution can take unstructured documents as well. And so, um, you know, obviously verification for those becomes a little bit more tricky, but there have been document types that some of our customers have requested, um, you know, that don't have some sort of a centralized source database for confirmation. And so they're comfortable with, um, you know, they're comfortable receiving an image of an unstructured document or something like that. So we, we can customize to, um, you know, we can customize um, so long as the business is comfortable receiving, you know, an image of, of an unstructured document. Um, you know, we do also work with a wide variety of technology partners. We're, we're um, technology agnostic. Um, and so we're open to partnerships across the board. And so we, we do have some technology partners um, who 
have physical um, document readers that can read a wider variety that are not in a standard format. Um, but, you know, from a source verification perspective, it is easier for us to work with um, because we do believe in source verification um, with with standardized document types that would have a um, source database. Amazing. Well, uh, you know, one of the favorite questions I have for for folks every week is some predictions for the future, uh, crystal ball predictions, if you will. Um, you know, given the COVID nineteen reality, uh, we're in many ways through the looking glass, and I don't know if any of this could have been uh, foreseen in terms of where we are with the economy and the kind of state of digital onboarding in general. Uh, but all that aside, and I suppose taking this with uh, somewhat of a, a grain of salt, but uh, more just a fun thought exercise than anything else, would love to get your perspective on what we can expect to see uh, over the course of the next year in the digital identity space. Um, I guess to, to focus that down a little bit, uh, do we think that some of these shifts that we're seeing right now uh, are permanent? Is um, this current state of affairs in terms of all sorts of new enterprises considering and adopting remote onboarding flow? Uh, is this something that is going to go back to the way it was post COVID? Or do we think we're really uh, entering a new paradigm, a new era, uh, as it were, and we're kind of going to look back on this and, and see things as a pre COVID and, and post COVID landscape when it comes to digital identity? I tend to definitely see the latter. I think, I think, um, this has provided an unexpected opportunity for digital ID to be accelerated um, in a variety of ways. Um, it's it's an unfortunate reason that we have to um, you know seek to to ramp up the adoption. But you know, from an industry perspective, I think um, you know I think where there was a some trepidation or the fact that there was already some you know, opportunities for people to just make this an, a nice, interesting um, innovation. I think it's actually, you know, versus being a sexy option, um, you know, to go through an airport or or a cool option to check into your gym, um, it's it's become actually a critical function now and in a variety of industries as we were discussing. I think, um, you know, not only are individuals going to be seeking more virtual opportunities to conduct certain transactions. I think they're just, you know, not, they're going to be, um, especially in the coming year, um, so eager to necessarily walk into a branch bank or, or, you know, walk into a physical location that requires certain transactions. But when they do, I think that they're going to increasingly be seeking out or leaning toward, um, you know, businesses that that they feel keep them safer, right? So whether that's keeping them safer physically or keeping them safer digitally, um, you know, I think that both there's going to be an awareness of both. And so what that means is in, in the increase in virtual transactions, I think um, consumers are, are becoming more and more aware of the data security around where they're sending their information and how the businesses they're transacting with are using that information, Um what kind of control they have over, over sensitive data. And then in the physical space, um, you know, I think biometrics is going to become, uh, you know, the adoption of biometrics is going to increase for sure. Um, whether it's in the travel space where using biometrics to get across an airport used to be kind of interesting and sort of a look to the future in terms of, of handling scale, I think it's really going to be looked at as a more immediate need and a safety factor um, in terms of just how often, you know, documents right now need to be um, touched by more than one individual through the airport journey. I think a lot of that is going to be replaced by biometrics. Um, you know, same thing in certain retail places, same thing in, um, you know, gyms and other like wellness locations. Um, things like that. I think that um, you know a lot of a lot of the rebound is going to have to to be anchored in a safe and secure digital identity that makes both the businesses feel good from the ability to adopt it and still maintain their compliance with privacy regulations, but also from individuals who are increasingly aware of where their information is going. Incredible. Well, 
Uh, this has been so great connecting with you. Uh, I think you guys have a really exciting product and it's something that uh, is in such high demand right now. To that end, uh, what are the resources that folks can uh, can look up for how to learn more about the product and uh, how to integrate it into their platform? Yeah, so we actually um, just redid our website. So um, it's great. There's a lot of um, great information there and more coming um, the, the website there is airsidemobile.com. Um, and anybody who would like is always welcome to reach out to uh, me personally as well via LinkedIn or, um, you know, I think my information is also on our website. Amazing. I will make sure to include those links in the show notes below. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really enjoyed it and uh, hope to connect with you again soon. Great. I really appreciate your time. Thank you.